first item of business is general questions. In order to get as many members in as possible, I'd be grateful for short and succinct questions and answers to match. And at question number one, I call Craig Hoy. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when the Cabinet Secretary for Justice and Home Affairs last met with the Chief Constable of Police Scotland. Cabinet Secretary Angela Constance. Presiding Officer, I regularly meet with the Chief Constable and other members of Police Scotland's executive team, and my last meeting was on the 20th of August. While the Chief Constable is accountable to the Scottish Police Authority, our meetings provide an opportunity to focus on matters of strategic importance and the key priorities for policing. I thank the Minister for that answer. She will be aware of a spike in antisocial behaviour across the bus network in Scotland. In East Lothian, this has included young people lobbing rocks at buses and assaults on passengers. Last week, a pregnant woman was allegedly pushed off a bench while waiting at a bus stop in Trenent. She was left bleeding and in pain, and after waiting an ambulance, she tragically later miscarried. Her husband has appealed to parents and family members to speak to young people to, and I quote, remind them every day how to respond and respect people and behave in public places. I therefore ask the Minister what discussions she has had with Police Scotland about policing on the bus network, particularly since the introduction of free bus travel for under 22s, and will she join me in calling for a policy of zero tolerance of antisocial behaviour on Scotland's bus network? Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, President Officer. And, um, the circumstances in which the member narrates are indeed truly shocking. We, of course, should be thankful that the vast majority, the vast, vast majority of our young people um, are, are young people to be proud of and are uh, excellent uh, citizens and contributors uh, to the country in which we live on. Can I reassure Mr Hoy that whether it's myself and the Minister for Community Safety, but also uh, our ministerial colleagues in transport, that we are very very much um, engaged um, in this issue and he may wish to uh, look at the programme for government uh, where we talk about the ongoing work for violence reduction uh, and also the actions that will be taken to tackle uh, antisocial behaviour. But it is right that uh, uh, people who work in their bus network and in their public transport should not have to put up with any kind of deplorable or violent behaviour. Drew Nicholl. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary can provide an update on recruitment plans that the Chief Constable has with regard to increasing police officer numbers. Cabinet Secretary. President Officer, I am pleased to confirm that Police Scotland are set to take on more recruits this year than at any time since their inception in 2013. Since March, Police Scotland has welcomed around 680 new officers and over 1,280 new recruits uh, since the beginning of 2023. Police Scotland have plans for further intakes throughout the year, with the Chief Constable confirming that our budget settlement will enable Police Scotland to recruit enough officers to increase numbers back to the region of 16,500 to 16,600 over the course of this financial year. Question number two, Emma Roddick. To ask the Scottish Government how it plans to support communities to bring derelict buildings back into use as houses. Minister Paul McLennan. The Scottish Government has put in place an enabling policy framework, including National Planning Framework 4, which supports prioritising sites allocated for housing development and local development plans and encourages the use of brownfield, vacant and dirt land in empty buildings. Support is also available for viable projects through a variety of mechanisms, for example, the Rural and Islands Housing Fund. It is, of course, for each local authority to determine its housing strategy and implementation with regards to the Affordable Housing Supply Programme. Emma Roddick. I was in Rasse recently discussing the massive impact of six new homes being built in the community. However, while the population is currently around 200, it's estimated that there are already enough homes in Rasse to support up to 500 people. They're just not being used as homes and 46% of them are empty. Building new houses, especially in rural and island areas, can be cheaper than repairing and retrofitting, and lots of depopulating areas have significant waiting lists for housing and a significant presence on Airbnb. What more will be done to support rural and island housing providers to buy back, repair and retrofit existing homes? Minister. Just on, on the, the Rassi Development Trust and their Carbon Neutral Island project, I've had the pleasure of meeting them twice. 
uh, online to discuss the project and, and the broader project about what, what they're trying to do. And officials obviously continue to work closely with them. I mentioned before about the Rural Housing Island Fund. They're, and of course, coming back to, to RASI, their affordable housing plans have embedded the aim of assisting households in Ireland to improve not just the, the housing situation, but also energy efficiency of their current stock. And I think commend them on the work that they're doing, but happy to discuss uh, the, the issue further uh, with uh, Ms Roddick. Question number three, Christine Graham. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government how much it has spent on mitigating any UK Government reductions to UK-wide benefits since 2019. Cabinet Secretary Shirley Ann Somerville. Since 2019, we have invested £750 million mitigating the impacts of UK Government policies such as the harmful bedroom tax and benefit cap and shortfalls in local housing allowance rates. This includes almost £134 million this year through activities such as the discretionary housing payments and Scottish Welfare Fund. This money could fund around 2,000 teachers or Band 5 nurses each year or further ambitious anti-poverty measures like our game-changing Scottish child payment. Christine Graham. I thank the Cabinet Secretary. That brings home the cost of being in the Union and under the UK economy. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, however, to focus on the bedroom tax or the spare room tax, which uh, we do mitigate? Can you tell me how many homes are helped by the government paying that and so that they don't have to meet it themselves? Cabinet Secretary. I think Christine Graham raises a very important point, Presiding Officer, because it, it can be perhaps uh, assumed that the bedroom tax has been scrapped. It has not, uh, either under uh, the previous Conservative governments and certainly no announcements that Labour will do anything like taking such a measure. Uh, we still uh, remain committed to mitigating the bedroom tax in full, and that does help 92,000 households in Scotland to sustain their tenancies, an important aspect both in anti-poverty and in our housing policies. Question number four, Alec Crowley. Presiding officer, to ask the Scottish Government what action it's taken in light of the most recent annual update on suicide statistics showing that people living in Scotland's most deprived areas are two and a half times more likely to die by suicide than those living in the least deprived areas. Minister Marie Todd. Firstly, let me say that every life lo lost to suicide is an absolute tragedy and my condolences go out to the families and communities who are behind these numbers. Tackling the causes and effects of poverty is a key government mission. It's also central to the ambitious programme of work being taken forward across government and within communities under our joint Go Scottish Government COSLA suicide prevention strategy. We're focused on reducing deaths by suicide while tackling inequalities, supporting deprived and marginalised groups who are at greater risk. Alongside our social campaign, increased peer support and targeted programmes supporting communities is critical. And since 2021, we've awarded nearly 5,000 grants, totalling 66 million to local projects through our Communities Mental Health and Wellbeing Fund for Adults. Alec Crowley. Thank the Minister for that answer and I agree that behind all these deaths is a person their family, their friends and their loved ones, and a lot of heartbreak. Can I ask the Minister, when will the Scottish Government be reporting on the impact of the 2023-2024 priorities in the Suicide Action Plan? And does she agree that we must understand what the impact of these plans and strategies are if we have to move forward and try and reduce the number of suicides that are happening in Scotland? Minister. So certainly just very uh, just last month we had the first meeting of the leadership um, board for um, the uh, mental health and wellbeing plan. I'm more than happy to write to the member and let him and update him on uh, what work is ongoing and how the plan is likely to be implemented. You'll know, of course, that the suicide implementation plan is, uh, will be carried out over a period of 10 years. Whilst there is a focus on the early stages of that plan, it is a long-term plan, and I'm happy to write to him with more details about how we'll keep Parliament aware of how that is progressing. Bill Kidd. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, as the Minister said, every life lost to suicide is a huge tragedy. And my thoughts, I know that 
will be across the chamber and with all those affected. Can the Minister provide an update on Scottish Government's Creating Hope Together Year 2 delivery plan published in July this year, particularly the focus on strengthening Scotland's awareness and responsiveness to suicide and people who are suicidal? Minister. So the two-year delivery plan builds on the considerable progress made during 23 to 24. We're proud of the difference we're making by improving suicide awareness, increasing availability of peer support across our communities, and using clinical evidence and our time-space compassion approach to drive improvements in statutory services. With continued focus on groups at risk of suicide, many of the actions are designed to reach and support people who are impacted by discrimination, stigma and the wider social determinants of suicide. Work is underway on expanding the campaign and learning activities, growing our social movement and to engage new audiences. And we're improving responses um, people receive in unscheduled care settings like A&E. We're also developing a new portal to ensure that people feeling suicidal know where to go to help. I'm happy to update the member in writing with the full suite of actions that we are taking, as um, mentioned to Alex Rowley. Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Organisations such as Men's Shed and Andy's Man Club in my region play vital roles eliminating the stigma surrounding mental health and creating judgment-free confidential spaces where men can be open about the storms within their lives. So what more can be done to ensure that these important organisations can carry on the work which is so desperately needed, Minister? Minister. So I, I absolutely agree on the point of stigma. It is absolutely a challenge for all of us and that all of us share in terms of stigma prevents people from accessing the help that they are entitled to and the help that they have a right to. Um, so work to tackle stigma is vitally important. Men's Shed, of course, have had an assurance of funding from another portfolio within the government, um, but we have also contributed, as I mentioned, with a number of different programmes. We've invested in, in, in SAMS, Andy's Man's Club, Wellbeing on Wheels, the rollout of our Distress Brief Intervention Programme. There's a whole suite of different areas that we are investing in, as well as Men's Shed. Uh, question number five has not been lodged. Question number six, Sharon Dowie. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the reported significant increase in shoplifting recorded in Scotland. Minister Siobhan Brown. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Scottish Government absolutely recognises the disruption and the harm to businesses from theft and other antisocial behaviour. And Police Scotland and partners are taking action to tackle and reduce it. We continue to support the innovative Scottish Partnership Against Acquisitive Crime Strategy. The partnership is led by Police Scotland, working with retailers and other organisations, including Retailers Against Crime and Neighbourhood Watch Scotland, with a focus on prevention, deterrence and, where appropriate, enforcement. The strategy seeks to minimise opportunities for this type of crime protect individuals and businesses and deliver clear advice and guidance for prevention. Furthermore, each local area has a local police plan refreshed for 2023 to 2026, many of which will include specific activities focusing upon acquisitive crime and engagement with partners and stakeholders, ensuring that focus upon the concerns of retailers is addressed at a local level. Aaron Dowie. Thank you. Shoplifting crimes across Scotland have seen a dramatic 34% increase between June 23 and June 24, with a 40% rise in East Ayrshire and 22% rise in South Ayrshire. And that's only crimes that are recorded. Retailers are facing attacks on their livelihoods, with officer numbers at their lowest since the SNP came into power. Response times are said to be unsatisfactory or significantly delayed. It's clear that the current approach is simply not working, with a high percentage also saying they are faced with violence and abuse. Can I ask the Minister what specific steps the Scottish Government is taking to support retailers and to improve police response times in order to better protect our local communities? Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The budget for police funding, even under these extremely challenging times, is £1.55 billion, which has been an increase of £92.7 million. And the police constable has confirmed that the Scottish Government investment will enable Police Scotland to recruit and increase police numbers. 
Earlier this year, I did meet with the Retail Industry Leadership Group and the Scottish Retail Consortium, who raised concerns regarding antisocial behaviour and an increase in theft. And it might be uh, interesting for one of the, the member to find out about an initiative that Police Scotland are currently piloting in Fife, which is the Police Scotland come together with partners and IT providers, which will help develop a platform allowing staff within stores to send direct details of crime to Police Scotland. And this is an initiative that will be hopefully be rolled across Scotland. Daniel Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I remind the Chamber of my register of interest in that I'm a member of USDAW, the Shop Workers Union. In 2016, USDAW's Freedom from Fear survey found that 2% of shop workers suffered violence. By 2023, that was 18%, and shoplifting is a key trigger for this. Now, the Minister just mentioned information sharing, but what steps can be uh, taken to spread that across the country? Because while we understand that police can't attend every single incident, what is important is that evidence is gathered and those who repeatedly carry out these crimes are uh, brought to book, prosecuted and punished uh, for these crimes, which ultimately often end up in violence and shop workers suffering. Minister. Absolutely. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As well as the SPACE initiative with Police Scotland, I think it's really important to recognise some of the really good collaborative work which is happening across Scotland. I've visited several projects in Stirling and in Verclyde where you've got the local authorities coming together with Police Scotland, with education, with local businesses and uh, to tackle local issues. And I think this is where it's really important to reiterate the importance of local police plans. Question number seven, Rona Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on any steps that it's taking to ensure that any increases in the Scottish Police Authority resource budget continue to support further police recruitment in light of the challenging financial circumstances as a result of the UK Government's proposed financial settlement. Cabinet Secretary Angela Constance. Presiding Officer, as has been made clear this week, following the UK Chancellor's July statement, the Scottish Government continues to face the most challenging financial situation since devolution. Despite the UK Government's cuts to our budget, we have provided record funding of £1.55 billion this year, an increase of £92.7 million, with £75.7 million of this for resource, allowing Police Scotland to increase officers. Police Scotland indicated that there were around 16,400 officers at the beginning of August, with over 680 new officers recruited since March, and I'm pleased to say that they will take on more recruits this year than at any time since 2013. Rona Mackay. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Whilst it's welcome that the SNP Scottish Government will do everything it can to protect frontline services and the public from the Westminster attack on Scotland's public spending, well, can the Cabinet Secretary expand on the potential impact that the Labour Government's decision to stick to the Tories' fiscal rules will have on delivering a fit-for-purpose Police Scotland service in the long term? Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, in the face of the financial challenges, this government has made clear that we will support people where it is needed most, including our public services, and that includes policing. As we know, all roads lead to Westminster, and we've been told that things will only get worse. We now need the UK government to invest so we can get our proportionate share. And if they cut, Cabinet it, Secretary, we will feel Cabinet the brunt Secretary, of that. Sorry, I'm just very conscious there are a lot of conversations taking place across the chamber, and I'd be grateful if members could focus on the Cabinet Secretary's response. Are you content, Cabinet Secretary? And just to uh, conclude, presiding officer, by saying that Labour austerity is as damaging as Tory austerity, and this government continues to call on the UK government to invest in public services and crucial capital infrastructure. Thank you. Question number eight, Edward Mountain. Thank you, presiding officer, to ask the Scottish government whether it plans to take any action in relation to reported concerns regarding to how the 2018 GP contract is working in the Highlands and Islands. Cabinet Secretary Neil Gray. Under the 2018 GP contract, health boards and integration authorities are responsible for establishing and maintaining multidisciplinary teams, working closely with our local GP representatives and communities. In doing that, it is fundamental that these services meet the needs of local patients, not more so than in our rural and island communities. While we have made good progress on implementation at the national level, we know that implementation gaps and challenges remain, and we continue to work with all partners involved in implementing the contract 
to further understand and tackle those ongoing challenges, including in the Highlands and Islands. Edward Mountain. And I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. What is absolutely clear is as a result of the 2018 GP contract. There are less GPs in the Highlands, there are less independent GP surgeries in the Highlands, and patients are having to travel hundreds of miles for immunisation. Getting primary care right is critical to avoid expensive secondary care. Given the contract is failing in the Highlands, will the Scottish Government undertake to review and ultimately replace it as it's not working? Secretary. So I, I agree with uh, Edward Mountain that um, having uh, strong, sustainable primary care services are criti critically important to avoid people moving on, uh, having an escalation in their ill health and moving into more expensive and problematic secondary care services. That's why uh, we are inve uh, investing in the likes of uh, the Scott Gem programme to see more rural GPs uh, come through the system. Uh, and it's why we're investing through the contract in multidisciplinary teams to ensure that we have a more sustainable uh, GP. Uh, general practice position, uh, including in areas in the Highlands and Islands. And I was able to see uh, some of that in action when I was visiting the likes of the Western Isles and Isla over the summer, uh, where I was able to see for myself uh, the impact that those multidisciplinary teams are having. I'd be more than happy to have further discussions with Edward Mountain uh, on that regard. 